Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Stuart Austin, the general manager of the Wilmot Cattle Company, a grass-fed beef business based in the New England region of New South Wales. It spans four properties, totalling more than 8,200 hectares. In 2021, Wilmot Cattle Company successfully transacted the, worst, the world's first private market soil carbon credit, and he's here to talk to us about that today. Stuart Austin, welcome. Good morning. Thanks, Lucy, for that introduction, and uh, thank you to the NFF for the invitation to be here. Um, we have a field day. Over the last few years, we've been having a field day at Wilmot. We get a few hundred people turn up every year, and Tony Ma was there this year and, and heard me tell this story um, in about 45 minutes, and then asked me to share it here again in 15. So uh, forgive me if I cover a bit of country in a, in, um, a fair bit of detail as quickly as I can. Uh, I'm going to play a video in the background here instead of a few, you know, photos in the slideshow. I've, um, you'll actually see a video playing behind me now. It's going to play on mute. Uh, try not to get too distracted by it. So there's a few really important messages that I'd like to leave you with today. And it's been very interesting listening to these last couple of panels here and, and the sentiment um, around the room, around natural capital. The first and most important point uh, that a couple of people have made is that monetising soil carbon or any form of natural capital is not actually the goal. It's simply an outcome and an opportunity that is available to those who choose to focus on how they can build more ecological resilience into their landscapes through a renewed approach to soil health, grazing and landscape management. In order to achieve this and to echo uh, these points again from the, these last couple of panels, data is absolutely critical. You cannot manage what you don't measure and as such, for us to truly know if we're making a difference and moving beyond carbon neutral, we must have data. We believe that more consistent profitability of agricultural businesses through all climate extremes can be achieved with a realignment of focus on profit rather than production. We need to consider how we can eliminate cost and thus risk in order to increase profitability while being better land, uh, landscape stewards. And lastly, this is all underpinned by people and the mindset and approach that they choose to take in agricultural businesses. It doesn't matter if you're at Ebor or in the, in the Pilbara, those who choose to view their, view their farms as an ecosystem Teaming with life both above and below the ground will prosper. Wilmot Cattle Company plays an important role within the MacDoc Ag Group. We don't claim to be carbon farmers. We're a beef production business first and foremost, with four properties located across the New England and Northern Tablelands of New South Wales. Our managers get, get out of bed and go to work each day thinking about how they can uh, grow more grass, improve their soil health, produce more kilos of beef and make more money from beef production. Our vision is to restore the ecological function of our landscapes in a profitable way. The MacDog Ag Group is a group of Australian businesses striving to show how a resilient agricultural sector builds natural capital and contributes to global climate solutions. It was a major climatic challenge on a farm not far from here that motivated Al, who you've heard from uh, earlier this morning, and Bert Glover, to go in search of country in a more reliable rainfall zone, less prone to the extremes of drought. In 2008, this led to the acquisition of our first farm called Wilmot approximately 4,500 acres outside Ebor, and thus Wilmot Cattle Company was born. Early years on Wilmot were somewhat dominated by the entrenched management. This meant small mobs being largely set stocked across a small number of large paddocks, generally being overgrazed and underrested. The farm essentially operated as a bullock trading operation with satellite oversight and challenges around direction and management. However, over time, plans were developed to breed, grow and grass finish a grass-fed beef product to be direct marketed through butchers and restaurants domestically. This meant breeding an animal for a start and an article of a higher quality than was presently being finished. This led to the search for an acquisition of an asset better suited to a breeding enterprise. Thus, in 2011, the 6,000 acre property called Woodburn between Urala and Walker was acquired. Woodburn initially operated spring and autumn calving herds aimed at a year round supply of kill cattle, again, generally being set stocked in small mobs in a small number of large paddocks watering on large dams. Around this time, Al was fortunate enough to meet Bart Davidson at a bull sale. United by their shared love of fly fishing, uh, Bart began to impart his incredible depth of knowledge around the relationship between soil health and grazing management on, Wilmot, on the Wilmot Cattle Company business. Anyone who knows Bart knows that he's a data junkie and a numbers nerd, and it was this obsession with data that has seen the soil health and grazing management aspects of the business grow and develop enormously over the last 10 years. Bart's first and most important step was to begin taking soil samples. These were 15 centimetre shovel depth samples uh, along the same transects at the same sites at the same time of year every year. We had a full soil health analysis test done on each sample looking at P, N, K, S, PH, cation exchange, all those things. 
but critically, he included total organic carbon. I cannot overstate the importance of the repeatable and consistent discipline of this annual soil sampling and Bart's foresight to begin measuring carbon over 10 years ago. We took these samples for the purpose of improving the productivity and profitability of our core business of beef production. In 2000, 2013, there was a management transition at Wilmot, whereby Damien and Tony Maloney joined the team. This saw a new and fundamental shift in the grazing management of Wilmot and the start of what has become an exciting, rewarding and fulfilling journey. Damien began aggregating mobs, moving them more frequently around the landscape, providing more significant rest, subdividing paddocks and extending the reticulated water system. And the changes in the landscape were immediately evident, as were the changes in soil health. In September 2016, my wife, and I, my wife Trish and I arrived from Catherine in the NT to take over from Damien and Tony as managers at Wilmot. One of my key questions during the interview process was, are the profits of the business reinvested in the business? And the answer could not have been clearer. Yes, this business must be profitable, and yes, they will be reinvested in the business. This is a key point. I wouldn't bother getting out of bed every day to manage a business that didn't need to make money. And subsequently, profitability has always been the most important outcome for us. The business stands on its own two feet, and I have an interest bill to satisfy like most others. By this point, Damien had been rotating primarily one mob of often over 2,000 head through approximately 40 hectare paddocks around the farm, continuing to satisfy the grass-fed beef business needs, but largely operating a trading model, buying restock of cattle and selling them at feeder weights. We were fortunate in those early days to have been provided with the mentorship of Tom Archer, working for Impact Ag, that had become Bert's business based in Armidale. Tom's guidance and, tu and tuition to me in those early days was invaluable as I transitioned into such a drastically different environment. Tom also imparted similar guidance and tuition on the management team at Woodburn, which also saw some significant changes undertaken there. For our landscapes to change, people in our mindsets have to change. 2016 was an important year in the soil carbon space, whereby Carbon Link had baselined a number of properties throughout Queensland, including that of one of our advisors under the ERF methodology of the day, and we started to pay attention. Among many changes we'd observed in our then five years of soil health data, the most significant and intriguing was the change in soil organic carbon levels, having moved from a starting point of 2.5% to 3% to over 5% soil organic carbon in the top 15 centimetres of soil at Wilmot. However, we had so many unanswered questions. Would it continue to build? Had we missed our chance? Could we be sure we could sustain these levels for 25 years? Was the market really going to develop and would the potential revenue even cover the cost to participate? While we chose not to participate at the time, we certainly continued to learn as much as we could about soil carbon and potential markets. Meanwhile, our core business of beef production continued to evolve. It was the first, I'll be the first to say that I didn't handle the rise and fall of the market through the 2016 season, 17 season terribly well, but we learned an enormous amount from that through our annual operational review process. There are six key metrics that I consider we manage as graziers. These being rainfall, soil, grass, finance, uh, livestock, finance and the market. So we collect data on every one of them. And it's this data that is one of our greatest strengths as a business and our most powerful decision-making tool. I choose to focus only on that which we can, can control, so I expend little energy uh, worrying about rainfall in the markets and instead to consider what I can change that is within my control to manage these external factors. We've considerably reduced our risk by reducing our reliance on inputs. In 2018, our 10-year anniversary, we undertook some strategic planning for the Wilmot Cattle Company business and really thought hard about where we wanted the business to be in 20 years' time. The grass-fed beef program had largely dissolved by this point due to lack of profitability, however this remained a core part of our long-term vision. We continued to trade large volumes of cattle at Wilmot with ever-improving profitability while maintaining the breeding herd at Woodburn. As part of this process, we identified that the biggest risk to our business was our exposure to the market at critical times, and that with the current assets we couldn't effectively trade cattle all year round, buying and selling similar volumes of cattle month in, month out to capture that margin irrespective of how the market's moving. So I began the search for a third asset in a more winter dominant environment which would enable us to trade cattle all year round. We decided that it needed to have irrigation as an insurance policy such that if we were committed to a grass fed beef program that required continuous supply we could turn the tap on as required to do so. This resulted in the acquisition of Morocco, approximately 4,000 acres north of Gunnedah, at which point my role evolved into the general management of all three properties. It's worth noting that this is where our strategy differs from others in that rather than trying to create an environment to suit an animal, for example, growing winter forage crops in a summer dominant rainfall environment, we find an animal and enterprise best suited to the environment and its climatic patterns, hence the acquisition of Morocco. 2018 also saw the expansion of Burt's business, Impact Ag, with the addition of more staff, notably Toby Grogan, with an environmental science background and experience across a range of sectors. We armed Toby with a range of data from across our 
our assets relating to soil, grazing, livestock and profitability and issued them with a brief to investigate all avenues for potentially monetising our natural capital. Tobury reviewed markets and schemes across Australia, the EU, the US and concluded the ERF to be the gold standard around the world with respect specifically to soil carbon. <coughs> However, we also engaged in deep conversations with a start-up organisation out of the US called the Regen Network who were looking at ways of trading environmental credits using blockchain. Toby worked closely with the Regen network, network for the next two years, developing a method that used our on-ground samples as truth points against a range of spatial imagery technology. By mid-2020, by mid Regen, the Regen Network felt quite confident they could, that they could accurately determine exactly how much CO2 we had sequestered as soil organic carbon in the top 15 centimetres of soil across Wilmot and Woodburn from 2017 to 2020. We laid on top of this our overall soil health, biodiversity and animal welfare metrics to create a, a carbon plus grasslands credit. Of course, all the usual discounts were applied around accuracy, permanence, uh, as well as methane emissions. This project would enable us to be rewarded for soil carbon we had sequestered in the past, as opposed to only that uh, from this point forward under the ERF scheme. Around this time, Microsoft had pledged to offset all of its emissions going as far back as their founding days in the 1970s. They released a request for proposals to which the Regen Network wanted to submit our project. We debated this at length during one of our MacDoc R Group strategy meetings, considering the rigour, the rewards and the risks of submitting the project. In the end, Al had the final say, commenting that someone needs to get a deal done for the world to start taking soil carbon seriously. I think we can all agree that we achieved that, Al. Uh, you may have noticed somewhat of a frenzy in the carbon space over the last 18 months. Of the approximately 170 project submissions that Microsoft received, their science and third party auditing teams accepted only 28, and only two of those are soil carbon projects, being from Wilmot and Woodburn. And while the crediting amount was based exactly around the amount of soil carbon sequestered, the, fact, uh, the feedback we received was, was that it was how we had sequestered it that most appealed to them. They got the story, and they got all the changes we had made to improve overall ecological health. And while some may criticise that we sold these credits offshore, it was simply a case of Microsoft being in the right place at the right time. Importantly, that soil carbon is still on our farm. We're still reaping the production benefits uh, from it in, its, in the first instance, while we continue to produce healthy, nutritious beef. There's quite a bit of risk when you're the first in the world to do something, and we didn't take this risk lightly. What we could not have envisaged was the enormity of the impact that this deal had. There were three things that, mo that attracted the most attention. One was Microsoft. The second was the value of the deal, being close to half a million dollars. And what we believe to have been the most important part of the story, the story of how we did it. How we'd sequestered that carbon in our soils. The overwhelmingly positive response we received from right around the world was both incredibly humbling and equally as energising. I've since given presentations to the UK, the New NZ, the US, Canada, uh, all around the world. Of course, in time, there were some detractors which we were welcomed and to which we have been entirely transparent with. Most notably, the science community have had some grievances with the deal. However, not one of those scientists has reached out to us to engage directly. Instead, choosing to use various forms of media to throw stones. This is water off a duck's back. However, it also becomes incredibly frustrating. Uh, the science world is decades behind the eight ball with respect to soil carbon, and while they claim to be experts, I've not seen a single paper that has studied the intensity of how we manage our operations. We'd be most willing to engage in some R&D here, but again, quite frustratingly, the lines of communication between primary producers and the science community are almost non-existent. As a hedge against the risks and uncertainty of the Region Network project, in 2020 we also registered and baselined all three farms under the ERF. This equates to over 400 one metre soil cores with carbon measured at one centimetre fractions across nearly 6,000 hectares. Again, the value of that data will be immense to our business. And while we'll now deregister Wilmot Woodburn from the ERF, we will shortly base on our newest asset under the ERF and we'll continue to accrue accus at Morocco. We also didn't stop sequestering carbon the day we did that deal. So while we have sold some credits, we're continuing to generate plenty more for us to use in whichever way we may choose to in the future. Throughout this period from 2019 to now, our core business of brief production has continued to grow. We endured the same climatic conditions as everyone else, but based our decision making around the things we could control as we do in any season. How much grass have we got, how many livestock have we got, and how much money have we got? Fundamentally, it's those three inventories and how we manage them that determines our profitability. We destocked almost entirely through 2019 and preserved cash. Half of Wilmot was burned in September 2019, and like most others, by December 2019, our rolling rainfall was at its record lowest. So what impact did this have on our soil carbon levels? Surely they must have declined uh, in such a horrendous drought and a fire. Well, in May 2019 at Wilmot, across nine sites, 
Our soil organic carbon levels at 15 centimetres average 4.7%. Half the farm was burnt in, se in September 2019 and we had 180 head left on the farm where we'd normally have about 3,000 by December 2019. In January the rains came and the restock began in earnest. I bought our first cattle on about the 25th of January for $2.90 and over the course of the next six weeks bought 3,500 head and fully restocked all three farms. We undertook our annual round of soil sampling again in May, May 2020 and our soil organic carbon levels across those same nine sites on Wilmot was 4.7%. Uh, it hadn't changed over that 12 month period through those extremes. We've undertaken comprehensive wire and water development projects across Woodburn and Morocco over the last two years and those assets are really starting to hum. I'm blown away by the changes in biodiversity as a result of increased animal density every time I visit Woodburn. Not once to rest on our laurels, 2021 was earmarked as the, start, as the time to start looking for the next piece of the puzzle. So in February this year we settled on our most recent acquisition, financed through a NAB green loan. Paradise Creek Station, approximately 6,000 acres outside Inverell. This asset's got extraordinary natural capital features, but critically is in a largely undeveloped, undeveloped state. So over the next five years, we'll apply our recipe in order to release its full potential, realise its full potential. The publicity that our story has received has been incredibly humbling. We're among the first few business, businesses to have been profiled by MLA's sustainability team through their Australian Good Meat campaign. And we're also featured the NFF's uh, Where Real Climate Action Happens campaign. Um, no one's recognised yet that uh, I'm actually doing the, the council work of lean on the shovel pose in that photo uh, that's been used all over the place. Um, we humbly but quite proudly share our story, not to beat our own chest but purely to help others. We don't have all the answers but what we have learnt we're willing and open to share with others. We believe it's our duty to do, th to do this. Our intention is to help others take a step back and consider how they could reduce risk build more resilient businesses with sustained profitability and fundamentally reconsider how they could and should be managing their landscapes for the long term. We firmly believe that livestock must be considered as part of the solution to the global challenges we are facing around, around a changing climate. And as a mentor of mine once said, show me in nature where you see monoculture, a straight line or a functioning ecosystem devoid of animals. We applaud the government's progress in the natural capital space and support their most recent announcements around ACCU contracts, carbon plus biodiversity pilots, carbon project stacking, and in particular, the $10,000 kicker for soil testing. This is the investment we need to create broad scale understanding and change around soil carbon. Education is key, and it's up to us to continue to pursue new information for ourselves, our families, our teams, our communities, and our consumers. When I was a kid growing up, my mother had written on every mirror in our house, if it is to be, it's up to me, and it absolutely is. Our fate rests in our hands. Whatever plays out over the next few decades and how we choose to respond to that is entirely up to us. It won't be the government's fault, it won't be the consumer's fault, this is our chance to write our own story, to control the narrative and show just how much we can do in our farms to slow and ultimately reverse the effects of climate change, all the while producing healthy, nutritious food. The MacDog Ag Group and Wilmot Cattle, Cattle Company will continue it in its quest to build resilience through rebuilding natural capital and demonstrate how agriculture holds the key to these global climate challenges. Thank you. Stuart, that was a fa fascinating speech. Thank you so much. It's really great to hear what you guys have been doing out there. Um, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit for us on your comment about soil carbon and the idea that the world is decades behind. What did you mean? Uh, there's um, frequently um, comments around there's a limit to how much soil carbon we can build. Uh, and, and we reach a point and we plateau. Um, I was at a day here in town nearly 12 months ago, um, listening to Australia's experts on soil carbon, and I heard um, uh, presentation after presentation of, of, pro of soil carbon research from around Australia, most of which had actually been researching um, other things but happened to measure soil carbon, and that you know, none of them resulted in huge uh, levels of soil carbon being built. Most of them only measured to 15 centimetres, some of them measured to 30 centimetres. There's been very little to almost no research done to a metre. And yes, while we reach a saturation point at 15 centimetres, we'll continue to build carbon further and further down the profile uh, over time. And of those 400 plus samples that I was talking about, um, you know, there's a common or belief and understanding that's quite valid that uh, the most soil carbon is held in the top 15 centimetres of our profile and, and that declines on a percentage basis as you go down the profile. We've got data in, from some of those cores from Wilmot that are, are measured at one centimetre fractions down to a metre, and that line is almost straight down in terms of the percentage soil carbon all the way down through the profile. So 
Um, yes, there, there, there most certainly is a limit at 15 centimetres, but we, haven't, we don't know anywhere near enough uh, beyond that. Um, and my comment around how we do things is there hasn't been any significant studies around the world around the intensity uh, and density that we graze at uh, and then the significant rest periods. Do you come across many um, other farmers trying to do what you're doing? Operationally, yes, absolutely. It's a, we have, like I said, a few hundred people every year turn up at our field day and I, I don't understand why, but they keep coming. And what's your view on the way they're taking up the approach? Uh, to natural capital markets specifically? Mm. Um, yes, I mean, what we did created an extraordinary amount of um, activity. Like I said, you know, the soil carbon market's become quite a frenzy over the last 18 months, for better or worse. Um, and, and, it, and there's been so many questions, and that's why we, you know, we knew when we did this deal that we had to be absolutely transparent about how we did it, uh, what we did, so that people could understand that, and, and from that will you know, we'll come more people willing to, to participate. Got a great question here from Paul Sloman on the floor. Uh, obviously, 2018-20 brought a very severe drought in the regions. Uh, where your properties are located in the New England, how did this impact carbon sequestration of the soils? Yep, so that was an example I gave at Wilmot. Um, you know, uh, when I talk about our rolling rainfall there, our average rainfall is about 1,200 mils. We got down to about 400 by December 2019, which is a hell of a lot compared to plenty of people further west from us. Uh, and, that, and our soil carbon level didn't change over that 12-month period, which is, again, it's a real proof point, and the science says that that shouldn't happen, but it did. And, and it's the same nine sites, the same measure, measuring methodology, the same everything that, you know, that we've been doing for 10 years. Uh, Woodburn was the same. It, it um, has been hovering around uh, three percent to three and a half percent, and we didn't see them. You know, it was worse affected by the drought than Wilmot, and, it, and again, we didn't see a massive crash in our soil carbon levels there. If you had to change the way you did things for the next drought, what would you do? That's a really good question, Lucy, and um, we should always learn something from the drought. Um, there's probably plenty of things that I can't think of right now off the top of my head, to be honest. Circle back. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Stuart Austin.